the talks. No objections? Good. So first I would like to welcome Julian Cassiesa. Good. Okay. Thank you, Julian. Um, so his talk will be Neuroscientific Data Management Using Data Lab. And Julian is a postdoctoral researcher who works on the cross-section or intersection of cognitive, computational, and systems neuroscience uh, to understand the robust flexibility in the human brain and perception, cognition, and action. In his research, he fuses a variety of techniques uh, from the human neuroimaging toolbox to make progress on those questions. So give us, give Julian a hard welcome, round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Jarek, and thank you for having me at this very special conference. It's not a common one for me, um, because indeed I am the kind of person that wouldn't know what I nodes are. I looked it up yesterday, so now I know. Um, but I'm really a cognitive neuroscientist by training. Most of the things I'm going to present I did in Berlin at the Max Planck Institute, and uh, I'm now based uh, in the Netherlands at the Donders Institute. And uh, I tend to ask questions about the brain, try to get answers, and I try to get them via diverse neural and behavioral measures. So we collect, uh, we design tasks, record behavioral responses, we measure brain activity on a fast time scale by putting electrodes on people's heads, we put them into brain scanners, we track their pupil, um, and we also run computational models on those. So these are quite complex studies that ultimately have the goal to, at some point, uh, get some results and uh, write up a neat narrative that either confirms or disconfirms some hypothesis that we had. But on this path, there's actually lots of stuff that's happening. So we do collect the data, and we set certain parameters to collect the data in the first place, which is already a choice. But then we have more choices. So uh, we're using varying tools, and we're faced with a variety of options. Uh, we are oftentimes writing our own code. Um, and ultimately, these results that we obtain will be dependent on a lot of these different parameters. Um, one thing that we would like um, is to make these decisions as uh, fair as possible, um, including reusable. And I've always faced this challenge of looking up at the hill um, or standing on top of it and looking back and seeing just how messy some of the directories actually look like. And indeed, it's not quite trivial to solve this problem because you basically don't only track once, but you run it for all of these different data modalities that you have that ultimately you also want to integrate. And so when I stumbled upon Datalat after having some experience with Git and uh, version control and code, was really a, a kind of emerging blurry vision of using this um, to really tackle these derived workflows for a lot of these data and organize them in a way that I can better work with them, but that also would make it uh, potential, uh, potentially to share um, all of these steps in an integrated fashion so that people could interact with it just like I can on my computer. Why do I think neuroscience and science in general is a useful application for this type of tool? Um, well, we're dealing with varying file sizes, including large binary files. If we're looking at fMRI data, large here doesn't mean petabytes, but at least uh, a few gigabytes. And if you have different analysis path lines, for example, those can quickly uh, skyrocket. You have multimodal data formats. Um, for some, you have uh, some principled way of storing the raw data, but once you're getting to derived data, it's really a wild west. Um, you have sophisticated workflows, so you're acquiring them, you're pre-processing them, you're processing them, you're visualizing them, and ultimately what you will see in a paper is only really the output stage of, of what goes in there, and you put a few parameters in the paper of, of the decisions that you made, but it's, it's not in a way that people can actually uh, kind of see uh, where things came from. You have multiple software packages in the, in the path line, and we're increasingly sharing our, our content, but with varying reusability, I would say. Right? Sometimes we only have the code available uh, and not the data. Sometimes there's data, but it's really un unclear which part of the code was used. And so that, that was always a bit of a gripe for me. So the plan for today is to give you a perspective of me as an enthusiastic user of how DataLab can support some of this reusable research data management facing all of these challenges with my particular application in neuroscience, but also discuss, in the end, some potential roadblocks that I've uh, seen both in my own work and, and when I try to teach this to others, uh, with the goal really to start a conversation on people trying to maybe accomplish similar things and, and uh, seeing uh, what, what, uh, how, how they are kind of approaching these, these things. And it can really be a rabbit hole. This is not just for Easter. Um, so 
I know some of you will be super bored in the next few slides, but I want to give everybody a quick intro of what the actual components are that I use of DataLad. So fun fact, I've never used the DataLad run command, and I think that's one of the big selling points, but I've just never used it. Um, so of course, we start uh, creating a data set that's similar to what you would do with a, with a git command as well if you want to have a pure git directory. And that has well, really served me well because you have these kind of quick shortcuts telling you uh, where data goes. So for example, text goes to git, everything else goes to, to binary files and so on. And then basically we add data and we run a data let's save command. We can run a status command in between and I actually like that in git to kind of see what, what's changing. Um, but, but that's basically the workflow, and it's, it's, it can be as intuitive as this. Um, but for me, it's usually not, because I think the killer feature for me is really subdata sets. And that's, to me, where DataLad excels at. Um, oftentimes, I am facing the challenge that I have maybe a fairly consistent source of raw data, but I actually do quite a lot of different things with them. It might still be just one pre-processing stage where, for example, I clean up the data and I, I filter it in different ways. But then these really go into varying kinds of analyses, and these analyses can go into different types of papers. And uh, this kind of structure, both on a local uh, drive, can be challenging. But if you want to share this stuff in a uh, kind of useful way for others, I think that's even more difficult. Here, the nice thing with DataLad is that you can have this modularity. You can re register uh, basically subdata sets as yeah, links to, to these super directories in a way that if I share them, and this is, for example, a screen grab from Jin, you uh, would, if this is the pre-processed directory, uh, see with a version tag what the raw data were that you were actually using. And you can update this, and, and maybe that gives you a bit of an intuition for uh, just how, how this isn't really necessarily provenance, but at least version tagging of, of these different components. And it really allows for really complex hierarchies that are also quite efficient because you're, you're already modularizing things. And then the, ni the other nice thing that comes with having such a nice data structure is that you can share them relatively, uh, uh, relatively well, efficiently because you can basically share just the super node and everything else will be attached to it. But you can also um, just choose to share s specific parts of these things. So it's also flexible. And there are uh, nice data lab commands that let you do this. Um, in my work, I uh, oftentimes use Jin just because it is a very nice integrator. And for me, it has been a really nice test bed to just see uh, whether things are working. And the key here is really the recursiveness of the operations. You basically go to the super directory. You tell it, OK, run everything recursively. And in the back end, um, it, will, it will try to align all of these links. Fingers crossed that the links are, are correct. And, and I, I think there's cool features with this that I'm still trying to get set up. So for example, you can have variable access permissions for these subdirectories. Uh, you can host things in different locations. And I'll try to give you a bit of an impression of this uh, in, in uh, two projects. So uh, the first one uh, was a contribution I did to a community effort called EEG Many Pipelines. And that was really a project that aims to assess the influence of pre-processing and analytic variability on whether we make a binary choice to say that hypothesis is confirmed or disconfirmed. Um, and it was not only about getting a yes or no answer in the end, but the people running the project also really wanted to see how people analyze the data. So actually having the analysis pipeline with the idea that uh, people could learn from how other people structured their code and also uh, looking at whether they could rerun the code themselves. I thought, okay, this is quite cool. This is kind of the project where uh, having you know, uh, access to shared files is, is, is quite good and, and managing code and pre-processed data as well because actually they're going to be analyzed by people. So let's just package them in data lab. And I, here's just the first example where I, I think you know, uh, sharing data and reusing data is of course a data lab scenario. Uh, the original team published this in zip folders. And I mean, this is a bit of a joke, but it was actually shown <laughs> at some point. Uh, and it's just not fun downloading even 10 gigabytes of data as a zip file, right? Um, I think uh, tools like DataLad are uh, great even at this kind of first step um, and then might become even more useful afterwards. 
So I can quickly run this command just as a demo. Um, and uh, this is a uh, data that install command. You can see that it has a uh, dash R flag, basically telling the system to recursively um, fetch everything. I will get some errors here because, or not errors, but I will be queued to um, provide some credentials, which I don't want to provide right now. Um, so I won't get all of the data because indeed here we have a scenario where I didn't publicly release the raw data set because people still want to release it in another fashion. Um, but I did release the uh, derived data from it um, as well as the results. So the original data set was around 100 gigabytes. Um, and well, as you can see, we're, we're making quite some progress retrieving all of this, um, basically with the same kind of structure that I had on my local drive. The code is already available because it's fast to download. And I could grab the data if I wanted to. You can see there are sim links here uh, via data at get commands. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the features that we have here. Um, so on the one hand, you really replicate the entire project structure as I had it on my drive in a very fast way. Um, in this case, I went for, um, you can see this is a GitHub link uh, hosting um, a super directory that uh, contains multiple subdirectories that are hosted on Jin, which is also where the binary content is, is uh, stored. Um, and that makes it both accessible or findable uh, quite easily for people on GitHub and then uh, has, the, has the actual data uh, grab from Jin. We can only get what we need. Um, uh, here in this case, I also nested the bits input data set. I'll, I'll show you in a slide. Uh, we have a versioning of all of the publicly available toolboxes that were used in the processing. Uh, and we also have a branching of different analysis versions. Just to give you an overview of what this looks like, so we basically have uh, here three uh, sub-data sets, one for just the raw data, um, one for the pre-processing, and one for the analysis. In this case, the uh, EEG data set is also uh, nested in the pre-processing under data inputs raw data. So you actually have a flat hierarchy that is basically uh, linked to some recursion. So if I make changes to the actual raw data, because I noticed that there's a file missing or there were errors in the coding, I could update this, uh, run, in this case, manually, because it's not run by a data that run, uh, the pre-processing and uh, basically have complete I a better idea of uh, where things actually are. So that's, that's the um, recursion here. The other cool thing that I just wanted to highlight that, that was quite a nice use case for me is that traditionally we have code and outputs uh, either in the same or in parallel folders, right? We create a version one, version two, version three. And I think that's been always the example for code that we kind of want to get away from this. But now we can also do this for data, right? We can uh, do a, a branch, for example, with a different filter at the output stage. And you actually have a version tracking of what the, the code changes were. Um, in this case, I can then uh, flexibly switch between the branches. And because, uh, for example, for the readme, I, I created a readme where it uh, basically loads in the file name uh, of the file in the data folder, you can basically have the same readme that just read in the different version files. So if I show you how this looks like um, on this page, you basically have, in this case, a master branch. And these would be all of the results that are obtained um, with this version of the analysis. But I can also switch either in, in here, the web interface, or on your computer, switch to a so-called no CSD branch, where I applied a few different parameters. And uh, basically, the outputs have changed. In this case, there's probably a bug in there if anybody wants to fix it. Please do. Um, but I think th this really gave me a, a kind of a view of the utility of some of this, right? I could, at, for example, the review stage, tell my reviewers actually, OK, here's an alternative that I ran according to what you wanted me to do. Here's the results, while still maintaining the original version next to it um, with, with relatively high efficiency. Um, so. So much for the first one. Uh, the second one I, I want to briefly touch upon is uh, that, that this also scales to these kind of multimodal uh, experiments. So the experiment that I've just shown you with the EEG data was a relatively circumscribed one. Uh, you're getting a data set that is fixed. You had very clear instructions on how to analyze the data. So the project was relatively small. Now, the nice thing is that it does scale well. Um, in this project, we really measured everything we, at the time, could uh, to answer the question that we had. We measured behavior. We ran uh, behavioral models on it. We measured EEG. And, and all of these, by the way, are sub-data sets that are different analyses. 
we measured pupil, we measured fMRI, and ultimately also wanted to bring it together. And actually, everything you see on the slide, unless it has the kind of code data doc structure, is a sub data set in its own right. So every kind of component of pre-processing or analysis um, in this case is, is a sub data set. And this is the structure, how it looked like on my computer, and I can actually share that with you in a way, uh, well, that is relatively flexible. I could choose to drop some components if I don't think they were relevant, for example, for the analyses that I actually reported on, um, but I have that flexibility of actually sharing it in a, as it was uh, when I did the analyses. Um, in this case, uh, I, I tried to push the frontier a bit in terms of what I was able to do and still am able to do. So here uh, I have a GitLab, institutional GitLab that hosts um, the super data set and then tries to uh, again point, so this is, this is basically a complete copy just missing the uh, binary content or the annexed content, and then the annexed content resides along with all other information also in an internal uh, GitHub re uh, GIN repo. And to me, that, that was quite a nice uh, idea because we are actually not able to share all of these data. There are some anatomical images that are not defaced. Um, and so I, I actually do think it would be a cool use case to make some parts of this private um, and yet have a public facing interface where you, for example, could access all the code, all the tools, and you might just not be able to access all of the data without me giving uh, you permission, for example, after signing an agreement. We can also take a quick look at, at running this, um, just again to show that things uh, move relatively fast. So uh, let's actually type things. And again, here, here we'll probably get some errors. Wait, what happened? This it didn't like. Yes. Okay. And this will still take a bit because it's, it is massively recursive. Um, that's basically this one. Um, but it, it will uh, populate it with uh, all of the sub data sets um, in here over time. And I think this is still quite magical. So. <laughs> all right. Um, some principles that have uh, served me well so far in trying all of this. Well, I think you can see I'm a fan of nesting. <laughs> And I really think it is, it is one of the things that really allows novel workflows that I, I just really hadn't had in mind so far. Uh, that also comes with the need to really think about, though, what are the separate subdata sets and what is the uh, nesting structure. And for me, it's, for example, uh, uh, separating them by modality, pre-processing different analysis stages. And if things grow too large, either in terms of file size or file number, um, also creating different subdata sets, for example, for different participants. But you actually do need to have a plan of how this wants to, uh, should look like. Otherwise, it's going to get a bit tough. Um, for me, it helps to also have a common naming to actually visualize for me where the subdata set starts. So I always use, for example, code, data, doc, figures, tools as kind of modular components of the subdata set. And this is part of a bigger problem of, you know, we, we should think about how to name files. And I, I think, again, this is quite a wild west at the moment when it comes to science. Um, to me, a realization was also that it makes sense to keep hierarchies flat and exclusively use underscores for folders. This, this might seem myopic, but uh, if, if you do have a f folder structure like this, it will ultimately get turned into something like this. And I know there's alternatives, but uh, we, we do need to actually, I think, think in the way that we name the folders themselves, uh, how they will ultimately appear, for example, in URLs when they need to be accessed. Um, and in the past, or in all of these projects, I, I I worked sometimes a bit forward thinking, but I was also retrofitting existing project structures which makes it, make it a bit easier because I actually know what the structure looks like. So I want to quickly go into a few roadblocks uh, that I think still exist. One is on the side of infrastructure. Um, I ran into various challenges even getting Git to run on, on some institutional servers. So I do think we need some documentation also for uh, assist admins to know what are the requirements to actually run these tools because it's really no fun if you just can't use the tool in the first place. Um, I do think that uh, recursive sharing for me is, is a really big use case, but it does become more complex when you do desire some degree of privacy in, in sub data sets. Uh, so for example, some platforms like Jin, to the best of my knowledge, don't allow automated changes or computational changes to uh, access permissions of sub data sets. In my case, I have 400, so I don't want to go into the GUI and always click yes, make it public. Um, 
it, to me, it's also a problem to uh, basically organize the HTTPS and SSH access if I want to share publicly and with, with pass keys, for example. Um, there's some funky cross-platform integration if I want to share on GitLab and GIN, for example. Um, and yeah, I, I think it, the conversion of folder hierarchies makes a lot of sense. Um, if, if I already know the structure, it becomes a bit more challenging if I don't. Also, institutional policies in the level of really big architecture can be sometimes unclear. Uh, we discussed this a bit yesterday, but there is a benefit of archiving things in an unannexed form because you less rely on the tools to be available in the future. And also, some institutions now work with quite tight project size quotas, and so uh, keeping data in check and, and not making uh, files explode is, is a big one. The second one is distributed collaboration. And none of these projects I actually used the key selling feature, namely the, the distributed collaboration aspect. And I do think it is now harder for other people to interact with the same files, because symlinks do require dedicated procedures. And there is a conceptual novelty to this, right? I wonder whether people can use DataLat without knowing at least the Git principles. And so sometimes when I'm teaching the stuff, people do get confused about why there's now different names for things that have a fair equivalent in, in the other language. It is a command line tool, so people will need to use it. People will need to have some uh, debugging. But they also have the community. So I, I think we can get there, but we should keep in mind that it is still a constraining factor. And I think for me, what's actually, as a user, very important are face validity or trust checks. Did the things that I wanted to achieve actually work? And GUIs, for example, are great in this, right? If I see there's a symlink and I click it and things get downloaded, I, I feel quite happy that things actually worked out the way that I uh, set them up. Um, and yeah, it, it makes sense to have a management plan. What are the subcomponents, and how do I want to set them up? And ultimately, I think we need more incentives to showcase novel use cases. Um, I do hope uh, that I gave you some examples of, of how I use DataLat, and I would be very happy to kind of keep the conversation going about whether anybody has similar goals and, and how they try to get there. So thanks again um, for inviting me, and also thanks for Reponym uh, for giving me some incentive to try to teach DataLat. Thanks.